Chapter seven involves the parties to crimes, parties to a crime. Um, an actor and actress, they often have supporting casts who assist in one way or another in helping them in their performance. Same thing is true. Criminal, criminals often are assisted by others in the commission of a crime. Except is called complicity. And what it is, or what does it mean? It's a broadly, broadly explained doctrine that it imposes criminal liability or criminal responsibility on individuals for a crime committed by somebody else, right? Usually because these secondary actors have intentionally helped or encouraged the primary actor to commit the crime. And these folks have a name or a title we either call them accomplices or accessories. And these are individuals who help another to commit a crime, okay? Um, just to be clear, uh, help individuals that help another to commit a crime that's intentionally help or encourages the act, okay? You might have heard of terms like aid and abet, or used interchangeably, aid, comma, abet, and then aiding and abetting. That's a concept in and of itself. Encourage, assist, advise, solicit, procure. Um, all of those terms relate to our accomplice or our accessory, okay? It's not a, here's a key point here, it's not a crime with its own punishment. Rather, it's just another way of committing a crime. So for example, um, you're not going to be able to look up in the New York penal, uh, penal Code what is the crime of accessory. Like you could look up the crime of murder, what constitutes murder in the first degree. What it is, is the person is charged with murder in the first degree, but in the language it will say charged as an accessory, assisted a principal in it, it will have the language right in the charge. So it's not a crime itself. It's a, uh, a way of committing a crime, okay? So we're going to talk about the parties to the crimes and what their liability is. But first, we, I, we have to go through, I have to give you a very large fact pattern. If you were in, in, the, in the classroom, this would be a little bit easier to, to get out there. I have this in a series of slides, so hopefully you either have these slides open in another window or you have them printed out in front of you because we'll be referring back to them and it'd be a lot easier in the classroom if I can click through them and click back, but I can't do that in this setting, so hopefully you have those available. So here's our fact pattern of people so we can put these laws together or these concepts together. We have Joe, the mastermind. Uh, he wants to rob a bank. He recruits Tom and Mark. And at Joe's house, they sit around the kitchen table making plans. They assign their tasks. Mary, Joe's wife, is present during the meeting because she's making dinner. She can hear what's going on. When the discussion turns to getting guns, Mary interjects that her cousin Mike can get them guns. And Joe assigns Mary the task of getting the guns, okay? So that's part one. The next day, Mary seeks out Mike. She tells Mike that she needs them for protection, two for the house, one for the car. Mike thinks that's kind of odd, but Mary is a good person, so he gives her the three guns. Later that day, Mary gives the guns to Joe. Joe gives one each to Tom and Mark, and he keeps one. The next morning, they head off to First National Bank. Mark's the driver. Tom is the lookout. And Joe goes in and holds up the bank. Okay? The guard tries to stop Joe. But Joe's gun goes off. And he shoots the guard. He then grabs the money. He, Tom, and Mark drive off. The guard dies later at the hospital. Tom, Joe, and Mark drive to Mark girlfriend's Rhonda, her house in the country to lay low. They, you should say they, park the car and hide out in her barn. Rhonda's out of town and does not know about the plans, but gave Mark permission to stay there with friends. 
Two days later, Rhonda comes home and finds them in her barn. She heard about the bank incident on the news. She calls the police. And the question is, who can be charged and for what? Now let's go through our common law. We're going to keep referring back to this. We're going to turn to the common law principles of accomplice liability. Okay, there are four categories. We have a principal in the first degree, we'll call him P1, principal in the second degree, P2, accessory before the fact, and accessory after the fact, and they have their abbreviation, okay? Now, um, let's take these one by one here. The principal in the first degree. That is our individual who personally commits the crime or to uses an innocent agent to commit a crime. Okay? So let's go through what we have here. I'm gonna give you a couple examples, okay, of these two, and then we'll um, then I'm gonna ask you who is our principal in our case. So a couple examples of a principal might be a drug dealer who uses a kid to sell drugs, right? Uses an innocent agent to commit a crime. <clears throat> Excuse me. A hacker uses a computer program to destroy files using an innocent agent to commit a crime, the computer program. You train your dog to put a bomb in a car. Again, you're using an innocent agent. I think number one is, ob is obvious, personally commits the crime and who in our fact pattern is that person? That's Joe. That's Joe, our mastermind, right? Now, what about um, principle number two? Principle number two. Principle in the second degree. Individual who intentionally helps or encourages P1 to commit the crime and is actually present and constructively present at the crime scene. Uh, constructive, what would we mean by constructive? They're there, they're near enough. They might be someone who's the lookout, I'll watch for the cops. Or in this instance, it could be a driver, right? Could be a driver. This is an individual who intentionally helps or encourages that principal or Joe in this case to commit a crime. And who do we have from our fact pattern that fits that definition? We have Tom and we have Mark. Mark, our driver, Tom, our lookout. Then we have this concept of accessory before the fact. And that's someone who intentionally helps a principal beforehand but is not present or nearby when the principal commits the crime. And who might fit, fit that bill? Who might fit that definition from our fact pattern? Mary, is that Mary? She uh, gets the guns. I would put Mary in the accessory before the fact category. And then we have accessory after the fact. And we're gonna circle back to Mary in a moment. Uh, accessory after the fact. That's someone who, though not part of the planning or commission of the crime committed by that principal, but intentionally renders aid after the crime. So someone who helps after the crime. This person might be someone who, let me get you some plane tickets so we can get you out of the country. Maybe they hide the weapons, or maybe they destroy evidence. What, uh, is anyone in this fact pattern fit that bill? Is that Rhonda? Well, I hope you say, well, she's out of town. She doesn't know what's going on, and she shows up, and she heard about the story, and she called the cops. 
Does it matter that she gave Mark permission to hide out in the in the barn or to hang out at the farm with friends? That's not going to put her in the accessory after the fact category. But what if she has heard about it on the news and the cops are doing an investigation and they know that she dates Mark and so she comes and she knows they're in the barn and they come to the door and ask her some questions and no, I haven't seen them. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Sorry, can't help you. And then later they learn that they were hiding out in the barn and arrest him. Can Rhonda then be arrested? She sure could. Accessory after the fact, she's hiding them out. Okay. So those are the common law principles. This slightly changes in the modern view, but not by much. This is, this is considered um, the primary uh, layout for accomplice liability. There is one other example or one other concept that I want to share with you. At common law, husband and wives could not be accessories after the fact or accessories uh, due to the fact that they are in a marital relationship, okay? And, the, <laughs> and as funny as this, so Mary in this instance is not going to be considered uh, an accessory after, uh, after the fact or before the fact because of their marital relationship. And the thing, the thing is their expe- spouses are expected to aid each other. Okay, so Mary might be treated as a principal in this instance. So you want to look at the relationship, but don't. We're not gonna not gonna confuse that uh, that concept. But if you have a spouse, let me simplify that. If there's spouses helping spouses, as in this instance, Mary may not have been there. Um, but the fact that she was married to Chujo and involved in some way, and if she wasn't related, if she wasn't related, what if she was Mark's wife or Tom's wife? She'd be treated as an accessory. But the fact is she's married to the principal and they're gonna be treated one as the same because it's, um, it's, a, it's a acknowledged that when you're in a marital relationship, you're expected to aid each other. So. That is our fact pattern as we go through. Um, those are the common law. We're going to switch gears slightly. There's one minor change, and we'll talk about that with examples. So the modern view and the penal, the model penal code, and the federal and the federal charges, the federal uh, um, rules. They don't, they eliminated the accessory after the fact. What we have are two categories: principals and accomplices. Um, or some in some states they call them accessories. Uh, we'll get to what happens to somebody who helps after a crime has been committed. We'll talk about that. But they don't have this layout of the, the common law. They just have the principles and the accomplices. And an accomplice is responsible for the same crime as the principal, and their liability is derivative from the principal's liability, okay? And they don't even have to commit the crime. Sound a little harsh? But the question I ask is why do we have accomplice liability? When should someone be charged at what, as a, an accomplice? Generally, individuals who are willing to particip- are willingly participants in furthering criminal conduct should they be accountable to the same extent as the criminal actor? Because that's what happens here. If you help a principal in some way, let's say the principal is charged with murder and the principal came, your friends and your principal came to you, and the principal, your friend who's the principal came to you and said that uh, I am gonna shoot my spouse, um, I need to get a gun. And you're like, I know where I can get a gun and you supply the gun. And your friend goes and shoots and kills their spouse. Accomplice liability. Yes? You were an individual willing, a willing participant in furthering a criminal conduct. Should you, but you didn't pull the trigger. Should you, should you be accountable to the same extent? Is that fair? What if all you do is supply the map and directions on where to find the victim 
or the plans to get inside a building that ultimately blows up. You blow it up. What do you think? Tough? Tough on accomplices? The theory behind this is the degree of participation is hard to determine. It's hard to determine. So statues attempt to determine blameworthy based on the criminal conduct itself, not on one's intent. So that's what they're look that's what they're looking at. So let's take some examples. Tom is in a car with three others. I actually used a similar example a couple weeks ago. Tom is in a car with three others. He is in the back seat. Mike is driving. Okay. The car is pulled over for speeding. Cop comes to the window and as he is taking the driver's license and registration from Mike, he says that he detects the smell of marijuana. And let's pretend we're in a state where it's illegal to have marijuana. He states, the cop states this to Mike, I smell marijuana, as he's looking around at uh, the others in the vehicle and everyone's all quiet. The cop orders everybody out of the vehicle, which he can do. Mike is scared, so he consents to the request to search his car, which turns up marijuana, glove compartment, stuff between the seats and under the front seat, front seat passenger side. Do we have, what do we have here? Cop doesn't know who that belongs to, right? So what happens? Everybody gets arrested and everyone's charged with possessing the marijuana. The job is up to the prosecutor to prove that there is um, knowledge. You have to have knowledge of that possession. And that's, a little, as I explained in the last session I brought this example up from, it's a little difficult to do. Um, but the question is, they've all, they all had it. Do we have an uh, accomplice situation? maybe, maybe not in this instance, but this is an example of where it, the degree of participation is hard to determine. And so everybody is going to get charged and it's going to be up to a prosecutor to sh sort out how, um, who's going to be liable and how they're going to prove knowledge. And the reality is they were all in the vehicle together. Um, so there's some constructive right constructive possession so this is just like i said i'm not going to go into the because we haven't talked about drug cases and, and and possession itself i just wanted to present an example that shows how it's difficult to determine who who might be the principal maybe they're all principals maybe there was some for <laughs> there was a bunch of, in my example some was found everywhere could have belonged to each one of them but those are, so that's something that has to get sorted out. Let's try this one. Tom drives his ex, Tom drives Mike to his ex-girlfriend's house to pick up his belongings. Tom knows that Mike has a gun with him and Tom knows that the ex has a new man. Mike is also the jealous type. Tom pulls up to ex's house, Mike's ex's house and stays in the car. Tom sees ex answer the door and appears to be mad that Mike is there. Tom sees and hears them argue. Then he sees Mike push her into the house and close the door behind them. Tom waits. He, he's surfing on his, his phone. Okay. Then he hears a gunshot. Mike is running toward the car, full of blood, yelling, drive. So Tom drives. Tom and Mike end up at Tom's house where they concoct a story where Tom will vouch for Mike's whereabouts. They toss the gun in the lake behind Tom's house and Mike walks home. What do we have here? Who's our principal? I don't tell you whether the ex, uh, let's say the ex is seriously injured. Who gets charged? After the, after the cops sort it all out. Who gets charged? Well, we'll say Mike. We'll call Mike the principal. What about Tom? He just drove over. Mike told him he was just picking up some belongings. Does that get him out of the, out of trouble? He knows that Mike's got a gun and he knows that the relationship is probably not so good. 
Mike's jealous. He then they he sees an argument. You don't have a duty to help. At what point do you think Tom might have some liability here? How about when he drives off with Mike and it could just be in the heat of the moment. Oh crap, Mike is running at me. He's got blood, but then now he now they're creating a story to vouch for Mike versus Tom calling the cops. In this instance, Mike certainly could be accountable as an accessory in this instance or an accomplice in this instance. What if this all happens and Mike walks home, but Tom is so guilt ridden, he tells his, he lives with his parents, tells his parents. It's two hours later, two hours after Mike walks home. The guilt has just hit Tom and Tom tells his parents what happened. They call the cops and you give a statement about all of this going down. This might be something different and we're going to come to withdrawal of aid in a moment. Our model, our model penal code definition for accomplice is that an accomplice must act with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of an offense. Okay. Um, and in our last example that we just finished, uh, with Tom, that's, and I want, I want to just kind of, if there was any confusion, I just want to make some clarification in these kinds of fact patterns. There is, there's no doubt Tom was there. Tom had a lot of information regarding background information regarding Mike and, you know, the possibility that some crime can go down, down here. But in his head, he's probably thinking, I just drove him over here to pick up stuff. Right. Um, and the question, I, I think I may have muddied the example. So I want to clarify it right here. At the point Mike comes running out, the crime has been committed already. Up until that point, there's that information that's going on that Tom is taking, Tom is taking in, you know, Mike's jealous. Mike has a gun. He's going to his ex house. There's an argument. He shoves her in. He doesn't see anything that happens after, but he hears the gunshot. And there is no, there is no duty to, to help. The question is going to become at that point, was he an accomplice? Okay. When Mike comes running out, the crime has already been committed. So the question under our common law is going to be whether or not he aided af after the fact, right? This, that would be after the fact. He drove and then he concocted a story. But can he be considered an accomplice with the information up front? And I will tell you in the real world, he's going to get, he's going to get charged because he was there. Whether or not the prosecutor sorts it out of whether or not he will um, more than likely there'll probably be some sort of agreement that Tom will reach to help the prosecutor convict Mike. But in reality, they will both be charged. It's going to be up to the prosecutor to determine whether or not they can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And some prosecutors will let a jury determine that if they can get the, if they can get the charge, they will put their facts out there and let a jury decide before they would let Tom walk away unless they reach an agreement with Tom to help them convict Mike. Okay. The stuff that comes after is definitely an accessory after the fact concept under the common law. I just wanted to clear that up because we're going to talk about that under our model penal code, but let's talk about this definition of accomplice under our model penal code. That accomplice must act with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of the fence. Okay. Now I want to point out that using, I already talked about words you might see aid and abet, encourage, insist, advise, solicit, and so forth. But are words enough using like when we say encourage, yeah, go get them, go shoot that person. I mean, is that, is that enough? Suppose I yell, uh, at a victim 
let's say you are you're aiming uh, a gun at at a person, okay? And uh, I walk I walk in and I yell at the victim who's wearing a hat, right? I yell, I say, "Hey, take your hat off and die like a man." Do you take that as encouragement and shoot the person? Is that would that be encouragement? My words alone by saying that. Or what if I walk in, you've got a gun pointing at your mortal enemy, and I walk in and I, I say, shoot him, he's a crook, and you do. Words enough alone? Is that my mere presence of being at a scene? You steal from, you steal from the store, the candy store, and, I, and I'm there and I see it happen, and we leave together? How much aid is enough? We're going to talk about those things, but let's talk about words. Let's back up. I want, I want those questions stirring in your head, but let's go back to this. Using words is enough. Yes, in the second example, maybe not the first example, right? Is there, There's kind of a, a different intent level. My first example was suppose I yell, you're, you have a, you're pointing a gun at your mortal enemy, and I walk in, and I assess what's happening, and I yell, to the victim, take your hat off and die like a man. That may not be encouraging. That's highly questionable than me walking in and say, shoot him, he's a crook, right? So mere, so words can be enough, depending on what those words are. Uh, let's, Tom and Mike are off to pay Sam a visit. Sam owes Mike money. Tom knows that Sam owes Mike money and that Mike intends to beat up Sam if he doesn't pay up. Tom and Mike arrive. Sam and Mike exchange some words because Sam doesn't have the money he owes Mike. Mike starts beating Sam with a club and Tom stands there and watches. And the question is, does mere presence at the scene constitute accomplice liability? Your presence at the scene. Back to my, you go to the store, you, you, when your friends go to the store, you, somebody takes stuff from the store and you see it happen and you walk out together. Generally, mere, not, mere presence is not enough. Generally. But again, I add a few extra facts about Sam knows, um, Tom knows that Sam owes Mike money and that Mike intends to beat him up. Like that he knows that that's what's going to happen when they go there. Does that matter? His state of mind? That's a tough one. And these are the things that, these are the things that come up. But generally, mere presence at the scene isn't going to give you um, accessory liability. Doesn't mean you're not going to get charged. Just means, in the end, uh, the prosecution might not prosecute because they can't improve. What can't prove what? The voluntary act in some manner to assist the commission of an offense. That's our definition. To voluntary act in some manner to assist the commission of offense. But could you argue that? since Tom knows that background of why they're going to see Sam and he's voluntarily acting in some manner to make sure that goes down or to be his Mike's backup if it goes bad, that's certainly possible. That, that could be a, a way a prosecutor sells the story to a jury because they can. What if... So mull that over. But the general, the general rule is mere presence at the scene. You and your friends go into the store. Your friend shoplifts. You just happen to be there. Uh, unless you guys planned it out ahead of time, you distract the manager while I put stuff in my bag. That would certainly be principal accomplice liability right there. But the fact is you have no idea and you walk in and your friend loads up some stuff in his or her bag, and you leave. Your mere presence at the scene isn't going to get you charged. What if you have a legal duty to act and you don't? Remember our legal duty? 
like parent child do you are you considered aiding and abetting and i should ask oh that's my next question actually that's my next question so if you leave your child with a babysitter and you walk in to the house and the sitter is punching your kid and you don't do anything accessory What do you think? Accomplice must act with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of offense, help or encourage. I think if you have a duty to act and you don't act, you are going to be charged with a, uh, a charge in and of itself, probably as the principal. What, how much is eight, by the way, how much eight is, is, is enough? What's enough aid? Remember Mike gives Mary the guns? Is that enough aid? The question, there really is no how much is enough. It's how much will the jury think is enough, right? What if you, what if you're the person who lures the victim to the back alley? to where Mike now is going to beat them up. Is that aid enough? I would think that. I hope you're shaking your head. Yes, I think that would be aid enough, even though it's just, hey, I'll get, I'll get the person to the alley or I'll get the person to the store. But there is no, there's no level. There's no exact answer with regards to how much aid is enough. It's going to be a question for the jury to decide to see whether or not you can convict somebody of aiding uh, and abetting. Let's try this example, which we actually looked at um, a little while back while driving along the highway with Tara in the passenger seat. Jennifer spotted Bob, her fiance, several car lengths ahead of her. She speeded up wave to wave at him. Bob recognized Jennifer in the car behind him, waited until she almost caught up to him and then sped away. Jennifer then increased her speed so she could catch up to Bob once more. Again, Bob smiling, waited until Jennifer caught up and then increased the speed even more. And this game continued as each car increased their speeds. Both were laughing. They were laughing out loud when suddenly Jennifer, traveling well above the speed limit, lost control and hit a tree, killing Tara. And the last time we covered this example, we talked about liability, who could potentially be charged. Um, but let's talk about how they can be charged. Who is the principal? Who would you consider as the principal here? Probably Jennifer. She got this ball rolling, right? She beat it up to wave at Bob. But can Bob be charged as an accomplice? What's our, our definition? Accomplice must act with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of an offense. that uh, they kind of desire the principal to commit the act. And what is the act here? Speeding. The act of speeding. I mean, Tara, Tara ends up dying. But what happens? The speed doing the act resulted in her losing control and then Kara, Tara ultimately dying. So Jennifer won't get charged with murder. She will be charged with some level of homicide. But did what about Bob? He get off scot-free? No, he doesn't. This would be accomplice liability. They acted in concert. That's actually the language they use in New York, and they act in concert together. The accomplice here, what, facilitating, promoting the commission of offense? Like, he speed up, she speed up. They both know that they were going over the speed limit. So in this case, we have principal and accomplice liability. Can an accomplice withdraw from criminal responsibility? Let's go back. They can. They can. And in that instance where we were talking about Tom and Mike, uh, Mike who beat up his or shot his ex uh, in that example, and then uh, 
Tom, feeling guilty, tells his parents, and then they call the cops. Is that effective? If that's what we mean by withdraw from responsibility, can accomplice withdraw from their criminal responsibility? Well, to be effective, I don't know, know what, oh, I do have a, let's do an example, and then I'm going to give you the, the lingo. Homer has devised a plot to rob the First National Bank of Springfield. However, he is unsure whether or not he should actually commit the crime. Marge launches into a diatribe about how the bank is a symbol of corporate greed and how Homer should teach them a lesson by stealing every penny they have. After hearing Marge's speech, Homer decides to go through with his plan. However, on the morning of the robbery, Marge has a change of heart and begs Homer not to rob the bank. However, Homer goes through with the plan anyway. Can Margot be convicted? So let's take this example first, and then we'll buzz back to Tom. To be effective, you need to terminate our complicity before the crime. Okay, you have to terminate it before the principal commits the crime, and you have to deprive aid, completely deprive aid of any of its effectiveness, give a time or give a timely warning to the police, or otherwise make a proper effort to prevent the commission of a crime. So in Homer's case, Marge has a change of heart and begs Homer not to rob the bank. However, Homer goes through with the plan anyway. Do we have effective termination? She tries to do it before the crime is committed. She stops aid altogether, but she wasn't really aiding. She was doing like an encouragement statement. Does that matter? She took it back. She's like, no, I changed my mind. I'm begging you not to do it. We know she didn't call the police, and we know there wasn't an effort to prevent it, meaning she didn't, like, aside from her say, begging and saying no, is that enough effort to prevent the crime? She wasn't asked to aid, so we don't have number one, we don't have number two. But what about number three? Make a proper effort to prevent the commission of a crime. I think she did, because she only really made an encouraging statement about corporate greed. Uh, but then the next day, change of heart and no, and begs him not to do it. I think that's enough to terminate this. What about our friend Tom? You're probably saying, but the crime already happened. I at least hope you are saying that. <laughs> the crime has already happened. So there is no withdrawal point uh, for, for Tom. Uh, in that instance. So back to our back to our beginning example. If Tom, who's our lookout, and Mark, who's our driver, they help Joe. Their plan was to help Joe rob a bank. But during the execution, the clerk or the guard is killed. I think I said the guard is killed. Who's liable? Should liability be imposed on the accomplices where the principal commits a completely different crime, which is killing the guard? Should they say, hey, look, we were only here to rob the bank. We weren't here to kill anybody. Should they be liable? What do you think? Well, it's, this is a concept that is called uh, the natural and prob improbable consequences of the... Uh, I'm sorry, natural and probable consequences doctrine. And what that stands for in theory is uh, based on the intent, mens rea, element of accomplice liability. It clearly suggests an accomplice should not be held responsible for the specific acts of the principal that, uh, or that he should only, he should, accomplice should only be held responsible for the specific acts that the principal, that he intended to aid in, right? So the robbing of the bank, that's it. If one helps the principal plan to rob the bank, drive the getaway car, and during the execution, then someone is killed, should we make that person responsible? And the law is liability will be imposed on an accomplice for 
reasonably foreseeable crimes committed by the principal. Okay. Is it reasonably foreseeable that if you're going to rob a bank and you're going to have guns, that someone might get killed? And under this theory, yes. Under this doctrine, if an accomplice assists, assists the principal with the intent to further a specific crime and the principal commits a different crime, that is foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable at the time of the accomplice assistance the accomplice could be held liable, okay? Let's go back to Mary under that doctrine I just read. Oh, before we go back to Mary. So can Mark and Tom be liable for Joe shooting the clerk? Yes. Yes. They were there. One was the lookout. One was the driver. It was reasonably foreseeable that if you rob a bank and you have guns and the guard or the clerk gets shot, then the accomplice will be responsible, equally responsible as the principal. But I want to point out the language that I just read under the doctrine. Uh, if the accomplice assists principal with the intent to further specific crime and the principal commits a different crime that is foreseeable at the time of the accomplice's assistance. Okay, so we got Mark and we got Tom at the bank, but we don't have Mary. Can Mary be, and let's pretend that Mary isn't married to Joe, but she got the guns. Can Mary be held liable for shooting the clerk? No, because she was not there at the time of that particular assistance. Okay? So that is that particular doctrine. And we got one more point to make here. So what's an accomplice's liability? I think I was alluding to it the whole time through this, this lecture is if all of the elements are met, the accomplice is criminally responsible for the crime, just like the principal. Um, and I asked at the beginning whether or not that was fair. Um, let's go back to this, this guard being killed. Okay. You rob a bank. It's one thing you're going to, if you're found guilty, you can be in prison for a while but a lot longer with somebody who dies, okay? So is it fair to hold the accomplices responsible when that was never their intent? And the law says, yes, uh, you are equally treated like the principal for being charged and convicted with whatever level murder that is. Does that mean that they get the same exact punishment in the end? Probably not. Because um, like I said, sentences could vary uh, on harshness. Maybe the accomplice <laughs> for a better deal will talk to the prosecution and help get Joe. But when a judge sentences somebody in the end, they look at various factors. You know, what was what was their level of involvement? Do they have a criminal record? Did they cooperate? What's their family life? What's, you know, do they have employment? So there's a lot of things that are considered for the punishment. And that might be where the accomplice gets a little less than the principal. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And there is a video that I posted that goes along with this. It is the uh, Girardardo, Nancy Girardardo sentencing. Her and her husband were uh, charged with kidnapping and several, more than several uh, sex related sex offenses involving the kidnapping of um, J.C. Dugard. You may be familiar with the story. Uh, she was kidnapped as a young, I think she was 11, and she wasn't found. Like They held her captive for almost 18 years. She had two children under the attacks of this man, but Nancy, her wife, was the one who would, uh, you know, elude or entice children into their vehicle. So they worked as... Uh, accomplice and principal. So there's a, a video where uh, I have posted 
it's cited in the book too with a little bit more of the storyline and uh, that's just an idea of how sentencing, how an accomplice's sentence may be a little lesser than uh, the principal's. So you could take a look at that, and I hope you do. And what happens if the principal is not prosecuted or they have a trial and they're acquitted? Can the accomplice still be prosecuted? And the answer is yes. Why might a uh, principal not be prosecuted? Maybe they help with some other crime. Maybe they, they give some assistance. Uh, maybe there's not enough evidence to prove the principal. But, you know, if a jury believes that the principal, that the, the prosecution didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, the principal can be acquitted and the accomplice could be found guilty. It's two different, it's not the same trial. It's two different trials and uh, two, you know, different levels of evidence that have to be proven. So yeah, it, that certainly can happen. The, the police can decide not to charge the principal and the prosecution can decide not to prosecute the case, but to prosecute an accomplice. Does that sound fair? I know it doesn't sound fair, but it unfortunately happens. And, you know, you can be charged as a uh, principal for the acts of your accomplice. Does that sound weird? If you're the, you're the principal and you don't you can even do the act and you're charged as the principal? What do you think about that? Charlie Manson was one of those people. He didn't kill a single person. He didn't go to, into any, and if you're familiar with his his story, get, just Google him. There's so much information out there. But basically, he was kind of like a um, a ringleader of some cults back in the or late 60s. And he had this huge following, usually teenage women. And he would, you know, encourage going to houses and killing people, not robbing them, just going to houses and, and kill his followers, as they called them, to houses and killing people. He didn't go into a single house. And he did not kill a single person. And all of the, those folks, you know, he was right along. He was traded right along with them. So anyway, that is our accomplice liability. We're going to switch gears. The next video is going to talk about uh, the concepts of vicarious liability a little bit more. Uh, how defendants can be responsible for somebody else's criminal conduct. We touched on that a little earlier. And we're going to talk about that. We're not going away from that accessory after the fact. They just have a new, they have a new role.